Okay, welcome back everybody. Uh, so thus far we uh, discussed the moral hazard and then adverse selection, right? So the, we, we consider the model, so from the first, okay. So from the first, uh, we first consider the, the basic principle as a model, right? We spend quite a time uh, uh, discussing that basic model and then we consider the what? Relative performance evaluation and then the incentives and teams and then we move, moved on to the adverse selection models. And in adverse selection, we consider three models, uh, task allocation and price discrimination and auction, right? And now we move on to uh, the topics that are interesting. I mean, the uh, more relevant to real life, right? So real life situations are much more complicated than the simple models capture. Uh, but these simple models captures very important aspects of reality. And, and anyway, so we, we, we want to uh, discuss these uh, realistic topics and one of which is uh, today's topic, uh, multiple tasks or multitasking. So uh, here uh, we want to consider a situation where the number of tasks is greater than the number of workers. All right. So, uh, multitasking and job design. Okay, tasking, task, and job. So, let me first define these terms uh, before we move on. So, the uh, basically, job is a collection of tasks. Okay, there are multiple tasks, and to collect tasks, you create a job. Okay, so that's the relationship between task and job. So there are multiple tasks and uh, to uh, pack some task, you create, you, you design job and you may have to uh, design multiple jobs. All right. So that's the problem that we want to consider. Uh, okay. And yeah, so what's the starting point? Uh, many, consider many tasks uh, to be allocated to a few agents. So the number of agents, number of workers, is smaller than the number of tasks. Uh, examples are abundant, right? So any job uh, it consists of many tasks. Uh, for example, uh, a professor. Uh, so I, I just give uh, the example which is most familiar to me. Uh, so a professor has to give lectures and has to write academic papers, right? So research and teaching are two most important uh, tasks that I have to do. So, but th there are other tasks as well. So I have to meet uh, alumni. I have to do some admin jobs. Uh, I have to apply for a uh, research fund. Um, I have to review some uh, academic papers will review uh, some other uh, public projects. Uh, there are many other things that I have to do, but the main tasks that I have to do are the, these these two things: uh, teaching and research, right? And as students, you you probably uh, have experienced this too, right? So a student is supposed to develop language skill, math. Uh, whatever science, whatever, and also uh, student has to a student is supposed to become a morally decent person or, or, or good citizen, right? So that's that's one goal of a public uh, education. So yeah, so we are living in a capitalist uh, society, so. We want to uh, grow a decent worker, uh, competent workers, but at the same time, uh, we are living in a democratic society. So we want to uh, uh, we want you to be a, a, a decent citizen, right? And and move on to the next bullet point. Some tasks are easy to measure while others are not. So uh, 
the, the problem is, so there are multiple tasks, and to design a job, uh, or to consider the relationships with these uh, the the tasks, uh, there are many things uh, that we have to consider, right? In in reality, uh, probably the logistics are very important, and the you know probably people's uh, ability are heterogeneous, so we have to think about that as well. But uh, in in this discussion, we want to focus on a particular uh, aspect of tasks, which is measurability. Okay, so uh, we have talked about information and inf the problems related to information. So here again, uh, we want to talk about information, uh, especially the measurability of performance. So some tasks are easy to measure, while others are difficult to measure. So uh, going back to uh, my, my example, a professor's research performance is relatively uh, easy to measure, while teaching evaluation is not always informative. So I think my teaching evaluation is not too bad. Uh, uh, please give uh, high teaching evaluation, uh, even though I said uh, my teaching evaluation is not too bad. Uh, the, the, but I don't, I cannot completely believe it because uh, teaching evaluation depends on uh, many other things uh, other than the, the the real value added of, of my teaching right so uh, going back to research so research is relatively easy to measure because you know you can see the number of papers they, that, that I wrote or, or the quality of the paper uh, that's relatively easy to measure because the especially in economics the journals the academic journals uh, can be ranked uh, there there is quite strict hierarchy of academic journals so if if my paper is published in a very good journal that means my research is decent uh, in that way uh, my my performance research performance is relatively easy to measure but teaching evaluation is tricky okay teaching evaluation is informative it says something but uh, it says something about many things okay so they um, my teaching evaluation uh, depends on uh, for example the difficulty of midterm exam or difficulty of final exam and um, and of course it, you know it, it 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 reflects the value added by my teaching, but uh, many other things. Uh, in, in, talk, in, in talking about this, I, I always talk about, <coughs> excuse me, uh, I always talk about uh, my experience in the UK. So before I joined Yonsei, uh, I used to uh, teach in a UK university. So I graduated, I, I got my PhD degree in 2013, and then my first job was a lecturer in the U in a UK university. A lecturer is basically assistant professor uh, in the US or in, in Korea. So uh, my first job was that, and in that university, the exams are on May. That sounds a bit weird, but you know, the sorry, not not the exam. The final exams uh, are in in May. Okay, so the midterm exams are in the mid mid of uh, a semester, but the final exams are in May. And before the final exam, there is a break, uh, Easter break, and in, during the Easter break, the the university throws a big party. And right after the party, there is a student survey the national nation, nationwide student survey uh, which uh, is about student satisfaction okay the nationwide student satisfaction survey is done 
uh, just before the final exam and just after the party, the big party, during the Easter break. Uh, and that was the secret why that university is among the top universities, uh, always. Uh, it was on one of the top universities uh, in this student satisfaction survey. Okay, so, um, and th there is a uh, academic paper, uh, there is a research about uh, teaching evaluation uh, or, or reliability of teaching evaluation uh, according to which the uh, teaching evaluation is low if the professor or the instructor is very ambitious and demanding. So if if I try to teach a lot, then my teaching evaluation may be low. Okay, so the you know I, 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 in in that case maybe uh, you will learn you will learn more, but my teaching evaluation will be low. So if I if I try to teach a lot, if I if I'm really ambitious and I try to teach a lot, uh, I you know push hard. I I, I give lots of homework, then the teaching evaluation uh, will drop. Okay, so in, in that sense, uh, teaching evaluation is not always uh, reliable. So that's probably the one reason why uh, teaching evaluation is not uh, considered in my uh, promotion or in, in the, uh, the, yeah, in, in, in my contract with the university, Yonsei University, uh, teaching evaluation is not considered. I mean, uh, it, my teaching evaluation cannot be too low. It, it shouldn't be too low, you know, as long as it, it is uh, higher than, I don't know, maybe two point something, uh, I, I'll be okay. So it, it is basically uh, not considered. And, and yeah, so the point is, uh, the, some tasks are easy to measure, uh, while others are not. And 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 let's let's look at the example of uh, students. So students are supposed to learn language, math, science, etc., etc., and also uh, the student uh, are supposed to be a good person, a morally good person, and maybe a wise person. But, uh, you know, wisdom is difficult to measure, or morality is difficult to measure. But language skill or math skill, uh, they are relatively easy to measure, right? So you can just see the scores. You, take, you, you, you just give exams and you see the scores and you can see that who is good at uh, English, who is good at math or contract theory or game theory. Unfortunately, uh, in this semester that is not the case because we cannot take exams. Uh, but um, in usual time, these skills like language skill, math skills or some specific knowledge uh, about some specific topics are relatively easy to measure, whereas uh, something more fundamental like morality, wisdom, or uh, I don't know, some characteristics, they are uh, more difficult to measure. So yeah, but that doesn't mean that these are not important. Morality is important, wisdom is important. And there is also the trade-off, uh, so let me give you another example. There is a trade-off between, sometimes there is trade-off between, between short-term goal and long-term goal. Especially in, um, for CEO market or CEO uh, compensation, this, that is a big, big problem, right? The CEO may want to boost up the uh, stock price, uh, that is easy to measure that, you know, the stock price in the short term is very easy to measure. And if you want to give very strong incentive for that, then the CEO may want to sacrifice the long term uh, potential of the firm, right? Maybe 
the CEO want to reduce R&D investment and just, you know, buy the stocks to increase the price. So there, in, in that case, there is very clear trade-off between a short-term goal and long-term goal. And probably that will be the case in uh, education as well. Right? In education, maybe the short-term goal is like things that can be easily measured and the long-term goals are more difficult to measure. Right? So maybe in high school we want to uh, we want to let the stu let students uh, read more books uh, we want to students we want we want students to be more uh, wise people or you know more like morally decent people but that, that is very important goal and that is that is very important for the society and and everybody, but uh, they are not easy to measure. Uh, relatively, language, math, these are uh, relatively easier to measure. Okay, and that is more short term goal. You know, it is it is really short term goal, right? So, you you take this course, you take contract theory, and and then, yeah, probably in the next semester or in in next next month, uh, you forget pretty much everything. So you know, getting high high grade uh, in in a, a course in the university is I don't know I I don't know what what that means. Anyway, it it's there there is uh i i think there is difference between uh getting good grade in the course and uh become a better person uh in the long run anyway so the when the performance of task is difficult to measure uh it may be optimal to give very weak incentives to all task all task that's the that's the uh, lesson that we we'll see that we we'll learn in this uh Discuss in this discussion, okay. So the reason is this: if a performance measure is too noisy, the principal cannot rely on that. Uh, so the principal will give a weak incentive on that task. So this is what we saw in our previous discussion on uh, what in basic principle agent model and probably in the relative performance evaluation too if performance measure is too noisy if no if noise epsilon is too uh, volatile then we cannot rely on that measure we don't want to give very strong incentive because if you, if you want to give strong incentive then you you have you have to expose the worker to too much risk and that's not what you want. So you you reduce the incentive. You give a weak incentive on that task. And the next point is new. Next point is uh, the reason uh, why we have to give a uh, weak incentive to all tasks. So the principal also wants to give weak incentives on other tasks as well, because otherwise the agent puts too much, too little effort on the difficult to measure task and too much effort on each to measure task okay so uh, if you just emphasize the importance of language and math too much then uh, obviously then the students uh, will not do anything else okay so because it's easy to measure if if you just give strong incentive on that then uh, the agent uh, will not do anything else. So that's the idea. That's why we want to give weak incentive on every task, on all tasks. Okay. So when designing jobs, uh, the principal wants to information homogeneity. So, so in other words, the principal wants to design jobs uh, within each uh, the the tasks are uh, either hard to measure or easy to measure. So it, it must be homogeneous inside the job. 
Okay, so you you put uh, hard to measure tasks to one job and easy to measure tasks to the other job. So we separate these uh, tasks to different jobs, and you and then you give strong incentives to one agent uh, who. Who who is to, who who is doing the easy to measure tasks, and you give weak incentives to the other, uh, right? So that's that's the basically the idea. And uh, before we move on, so let's go to let's just look at this. Uh, let's look at this uh, document. What is this document? Doc this this Nobel Prize document. Uh, let's just go back to this point so f first we talked about tension between insurance and incentive right so uh, we discussed moral hazard and there the critical problem is the measurability the or the asymmetric information problem because of the asymmetric information problem uh, there is moral hazard problem so uh, we see the tension between insurance and incentive and then uh, we talked about informativeness principle, right? So what is the informativeness principle? We, we saw this uh, in discussing the relative performance evaluation. So uh, according to this, uh, when designing an incentive contract, we have to uh, incorporate, we have to use all available uh, potentially relevant information. So that's the reason why relative performance evaluation can improve efficiency of incentive contract, right? And then uh, we did what? We we now uh, talk about this. So the, what what is the title? Title is title of these uh, uh, paragraphs is strong incentives versus balanced incentives. So. Let's just think about this: the strong incentives versus balanced incentive. So, in 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 this incentive contract, when we talk about uh, relative performance in, uh, evaluation and etc., uh, you might get the f impression that uh, the uh, strong incentive is better than weak incentive, right? So we, we may want to give very strong incentive uh, whenever possible, but in reality, uh, in in reality many situations incentive contracts are not used at all in, in many situations just fixed salaries are given and uh, even if incentives are used incentive contracts are used they are uh, very weak incentives and, and there are probably many reasons in reality uh, many reasons we don't observe uh, the strong incentives very often uh, what, the, the, these are two uh, explanations. One is career concern, which we'll discuss later after this, after multitasking. And uh, another reason, uh, another explanation uh, for this variety of uh, incentive contract is this, multitasking. Okay, multitasking. So uh, uh, I just want to encourage you uh, to go back to this uh, Nobel Prize document and read it again and probably you will see that you, can, you now can understand it uh, much better. Okay, and, and now we are, we are d discussing this multitasking and career concern. And we talked about teamwork, so we talked about this, uh, what, what, was, what was the problem, the free riding problem uh, before. So we talked about that and we also talked about adverse selection, uh, which is not discussed in uh, this document. In, in this document, only uh, moral hazard and some other problems are discussed. But I, I really wanted to uh, talk about um, adverse selection problem because it is such a central problem in contract theory. Okay, uh, let's go back to this slide. So, uh, yeah. So now, now you can see why we are discussing this multi multitasking problem. So uh, in this, we see uh, two problems. One is normative, the other is positive. Uh, positively, the question is, 
why in reality aren't there uh, many uh, incentive contracts right so why 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 are incentive contracts uh, rarely used uh, in in reality uh, maybe that's an exaggeration it's used a lot but uh, it's not ubiquitous one uh, explanation is this multitasking and the other question the other problem the other question is normative question uh, then uh, in the presence uh, of multitasking and and this problem uh, what is the best form of contract so there is a normative question so how do we uh, how do we design a contract uh, or how, how do you design a job uh, which is optimal uh, in the presence of this measurability or, or, or heterogeneous measurability or information heterogeneity okay so that's that's the the other question so first question is positive the other question is normative first question is that uh, we want to uh, know why in reality uh, incentive contract is not ubiquitously used uh, the, the other question is normative question. The normative question is like uh, in designing a job, uh, what do we have to consider? Uh, how, do, how can we uh, design a uh, optimal jobs? Okay, right. Uh, then move on to the model. Uh, so, uh, so we consider simple labor contract situation one employer one worker so it's basically same with the basic principle as a model but the difference is uh, we have two tasks so i is one and two i are one or two so we have two tasks uh, one worker so one worker is doing two tasks okay so that's the simplest situation that uh, we can consider this multitasking problem Okay, and performance measure is xi, i is for uh, task i, so ai is effort exerted uh, to task i, and epsilon i is the noise that follows normal distribution, and that's specific to i, and we assume epsilon i and epsilon j are independent. So, two performances are independently measured. And the problem is, here the sigma i squared. Can you can you see it? So I, so epsilon i follows uh, normal distribution with zero mean, and the variance is sigma i squared. And as you can imagine, this variance uh, doesn't have these variances do not have to be the same to each other, right? So they maybe one uh, performance measure is less noisy uh, than the other so that's the that's the, the one one source of the problem okay so one me one one problem sorry uh, one task is uh, easier to measure than the other uh, and and then in that case how what should you do okay that's the problem and uh, the agents utility function looks like this is a color utility function and so it is basically same as before but uh, only the cost function is now different now the cost function is a function of a1 and a2 because this one person is doing both jobs bo I mean both tasks uh, the uh, the, this agent must uh, bear the cost of both effort a1 and a2 okay so c of a1 a2 equals half times c1 uh, times a1 squared plus c2 times a2 squared so this is same as before so the last term delta times a1 times a2 right so can you see it so uh, the cost function is quadratic function so here so the, the first two terms uh, are just typical quadratic cost function and the last one is the new one delta times a1 times a2 so uh, what does that mean so if delta is zero then two efforts are technically independent 
what that means is we can basically separate these two tasks and think about each task separately. That will be the case if delta is zero. So if delta is zero, then you are not interfered by uh, doing other things. So you study contract theory and you study game theory and, and if delta is zero, then you know these two are two separate things. You you are you are not bothered uh, by studying two things uh, together. Uh, but that will not be the case uh, if delta is positive. If delta is positive, that means raising f photon one task raises the marginal cost of uh, of of f photon the other task as well. So the reason is maybe exhaustion, like you, you exhaust it. So you, you study game theory for five, day, five, five hours, and then you try to study uh, contract theory. Then obviously you will be exhausted, and then uh, the marginal cost of studying one hour of uh, contract theory will be much higher than the situation where you don't study game theory at all, right? So. You know that's the one one obvious reason why there is a uh, some technical interference uh, across the, these two tasks, right? So uh, you know when 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 so let's just think about this term multitasking. So when in in, in real life this term multitasking is used in I think in 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 a situation like this so he can he can do multitasking very well right so that what does that mean that means implicitly what is assumed there is multitasking is not easy so for many people uh, multitasking is not easy uh, and the reason is uh, you you your 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 focus your your attention or your uh, uh, Whatever your 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 ability is interfered, uh, it, it is reduced. Uh, your productivity is, is reduced uh, if you are doing uh, multiple tasks, right? So because of exhaustion or just you are uh, distracted, right? So for example, uh, maybe game theory and contract theory are similar, but uh, let's think about uh, poetry, maybe. Uh, or something completely different things, or music. So you study uh, contract theory and uh, you study music, and these are two different things, and you you have to use two different area areas of your brain. So if you just do one things, then and then you try to do something else, then your brain is somehow interfered. So it is very difficult to focus, etc. Uh, etc. Et right. So. That may be an example. That may be a reason why uh, multiple, multiple multitasking is uh, so difficult. And uh, language is a very good example. So, for example, I I, uh, I teach one course. Uh, actually, I I, I teach uh, three courses in this this semester in total. And uh, in two courses, uh, I use Korean. And only for this course. I use English, and it is very confusing. You know, sometimes uh, I accidentally says I I accidentally say a Korean uh, in English course, and I accidentally uh, maybe it's not accidentally. I I always use English uh, words uh, in Korean uh, courses, so that's not big deal. But uh, in in English courses, uh, I sometimes just say. Uh, some Korean words uh, without noticing it. That's very confusing. Okay, that that may be an example of this difficulty of multi multitasking. And okay, so uh, I I think that I I, I gave uh, enough motivation for this assumption. Uh, then uh, let's just look at the third bullet point of uh, third small bullet points. So. I, it says that delta uh, is greater than or equal to zero, 
and it, it is smaller than square root c1, c2. Okay, so you may wonder what is this square root c1, c2. So let's look at the bottom, uh, uh, the last bullet point. If delta is too large, if delta is larger than square root c1 times c2, uh, since it is too costly to work both tasks, uh, it is optimal to focus on only one task. So if delta is very, very large, then multitasking is very difficult. So in that case, uh, you may just want to focus on one task. And the principal, the employer, may want to give just one task because it is too costly to uh, do multiple tasking, uh, multitasking, okay? And you may wonder why, why then, okay, so that, that makes sense, uh, that intuitively makes sense, you know, if delta is too large, then uh, doing multitasking is too uh, co costly, okay, that makes sense, but then why square root c1 times c2, uh, you may wonder. So uh, let's look at this diagram. So wh what is this? I they are isoprofit curves of the cost function. So you fix the cost level, and you want to uh, you want to plot the uh, a1 and a2, which gives the same level of cost. Okay. So uh, the ISO profit ISO ISO cost curve looks like this. So this and, and why do we care about ISO cost curve? Because uh, we want to minimize the cost. The agent want to minimize the cost, and and the principal uh, will have to compensate the cost eventually. So the comp the principal also wants to minimize the effort cost. So that's why we want to uh, so. We, we will have to think about cost minimization problem and that's why we consider this ISO cost curve and and as you can see if delta is very small then the ISO cost curve uh, drawn on this A1 and A2 space is concave so you can see that very easily uh, if you uh, think about the case where delta is zero, so let's let's assume delta is zero, then the cost curve, ISO cost curve, is basically circle, right? So uh, it's it's not exactly circle. It, it is a what? Uh, it is a. It's not hyperbolic. It's a. You know, you know what it is. It, it is similar to circle. So, uh, if delta is zero, it, it is very similar to circle. And if delta increases, uh, so when that when when delta is square root c one times c two, uh, let's look at the second bullet point. If delta equals to uh, square root c one times c two, then the cost function can be written like this. So the uh, in the second line, I replace delta by square root c1 and c2. And then uh, you factorize it. You can factorize it uh, to get the last line. In the, in the last line, uh, the cost function is half times uh, square root uh, c1 times a1 plus square root c2 times a2 squared. All right, so the uh, what that means is the relationship between a1 and a2 is linear, right? So when you when you draw the iso iso cost curve, uh, the relationship between a1 and a2 is linear. So if you draw the iso cost curve, it will be it it will be it will look like the one on the left diagram. Right, so in the diagram, you see when delta is uh, square root c on c two, the iso cost curve will be a, a a a linear line. Right, so that will be the case. And if delta is larger than this, then uh, the iso cost curve will be uh, what? Iso cost curve will be 
uh, convex and in that case given this ISO cost curve uh, if you want to reduce the cost as much as possible given the revenue or profit or surplus generated by it uh, you may want to just focus on uh, one task so in other words uh, given this uh, very large delta if you solve the profit maximization or utility maximization problem then the solution will be a corner solution okay so you just want to uh, focus on just one thing you just uh, uh, focus on task one and uh, set a2 equals to zero or you just focus on task two and set uh, a1 equals to zero that will be the case if delta is very large okay so that's why we want to focus on the situation where delta is smaller than square root c1 and c2 so we want to focus on the interior solution okay and the principle offers a piece rate contract or the linear contract as before so w the wage is t times uh, sorry t plus s1 times x1 plus s2 times x2 and given this contract the agent's problem can be written like this so we have seen this we have we have done this so uh, given the utility uh, the car utility function of the agent and given the normal, distrib uh, normal distribution assumption of the noise and given this uh, piece rate contract the the agent's utility maximization problem uh, can be written like this so the utility function can be represented by this mean variance uh, utility function so it is called mean variance utility function because the first uh, terms uh, uh, the mean of the wage so t plus s1 times a1 plus s2 times a2 is the mean of the wage right so mean of the wage the average average wage or expected wage is t plus s1 times a1 plus s2 times a2 and the next term eta over 2 uh, times s1 squared sigma 1 squared plus s2 squared uh, times sigma 2 squared so this is the variance term right so s1 squared times sigma 1 squared plus s2 squared times sigma 2 squared is the variance of the wage so it's, it's called mean variance utility function because it's, it consists of a mean and variance and what are the less terms the less terms are simply the effort cost so it has nothing to do with the wage so uh, but in in this case the effort cost uh, looks a bit complicated right so it's half times c1 times a1 squared plus c2 times a2 squared minus delta times a1 times a2 so this entire thing is the effort cost so uh, what's the first step uh, to solve this problem uh, you first maximize this utility function uh, to get the optimal uh, effort given wage so the wage uh, or, or wage contract is given and given the wage contract in other words given t and s1 and s2 uh, the the agent uh, maximizes uh, the utility function by choosing a1 and a2 okay so that will be the first step that is that is the last stage problem of this model and then and then you know we are we are using backward induction so we start from the last stage and we move backward we move upward so and then we consider this principles problem right so the principles problem is to maximize the web maximize the profit uh, subject to uh, IC and IR constraints so the principles problem so the principles objective function is the profit right so uh, a1 is the revenue expected revenue generated by uh, generated in task one and uh, as one much of it as one percentage of it will be given to the agent and one minus 
1 minus S1 of the surplus will be given to the principal. Right? And from task 2, A2, much of expected revenue uh, will be generated, and uh, S2 of it will be given to the uh, worker, and 1 minus S2 of it will be given to the principal. And T is the fixed wage. All right, so that's, that's the expected uh, profit of the principal. And uh, what are this, what are these uh, cons constraints? The first two constraints are the IC constraints, which are obtained uh, from the agent's utility maximization problem. So you, uh, let's go back to the previous slide. So you solve this problem, the ut uh, agent's utility maximization problem, then you get these two solutions, A1 and A2. So A1 equals to uh, S1 times C2 minus delta uh, S2 over C1 times C2 minus delta squared. So, uh, just quick observation. If you put zero in delta, then what happens? If delta is zero, then A1, the optimal uh, effort level uh, given the wage schedule is simply S1 over C1, right? Can you see it? So let's, let's put zero in delta, then A1 is S1 over C1. Uh, uh, similarly, A2 will be S2 over C2. Okay, so what does that mean? So if delta is zero, then we can separate these two problems. We can, we can, uh, we, we don't we don't have to this mingle uh, we, we don't have to consider these two tasks uh, together we just separate these two tasks and consider uh, uh, them as uh, two separate problems in that case the optimal effort will be the same as before the same optimal effort uh, that we saw in the basic principle laser model Right in the basic principle agent model, we saw that the optimal effort is S1 over uh, C1. In that in 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 that ba in the basic model, there was no uh, subscript one or two, but uh, it was basically the same thing. Right, so the A is simply S over C. So that's what we saw in the basic principle agent model, and you can see that if delta is zero, that's exactly the case. And at the bottom, uh, you see the IR constraint or the participation constraint. Uh, so it requires that the expected uh, mean variance utility must be greater than or equal to uh, W underbar, which is the reservation wage. All right, and then you solve this problem and then you get the solution. Uh, it looks, uh, the, the solution looks very complicated, uh, maybe even monstrous, so I don't want to uh, dig, dig, get, uh, dig them deeper. Uh, I, 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 I would not uh, expect you to solve this problem uh, in an exam, but, <coughs> but in your leisure time or, 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 in, 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 or, or as a practice, uh, you can derive this. And, and I, I actually recommend you to derive this uh, solution. Uh, you can do that. And I, I recommend it. Okay, that's, that's a good practice. Uh, and doing it may look uh, irrelevant or, 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 or waste of time, but it's, it's not. You know, doing this is not waste of time. It's a practice, and 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 it's a way to sharpen your uh, thinking or, or 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 your attention. Okay. Uh, by the way, I, and I I I'm I'm concerned about uh, your learning in this semester because my philosophy uh, on education is that. Uh, you learn something uh, when you use your hands, okay? So if you just listen to what I'm saying, or if, if you just look at the uh, slides, then you don't learn anything. Uh, that's, that's my philosophy, that's my uh, beliefs, okay? So the 
I, I'm I'm really concerned about uh, your learning uh, in this semester. In this semester, so uh, whenever possible, I I want to uh, emphasize that uh, whenever possible, you use your you, you use your hand, and if it is if some uh, mathematical formulas or mathematical expressions look complicated, and if it looks very difficult to understand, then just use your hands. So write it down and then you can understand it better. You know, that's actually quite amazing. You know, just just writing it down uh, makes makes you uh, understand it better. That's quite amazing. So uh, I, I, I strongly recommend you to uh, solve this uh, problem or at least write this solution down. Uh, here, here is one practice that you can do uh, right now. So let's assume delta is zero. Okay, let's let's put zero in delta, and show that this s1 star and s2 star are the same s stars that we we found in the basic principle agent model. So in other words, if delta is zero, then this model just boils down to the basic principle agent model, and the solution will be exactly the same. In other words, if delta is zero, or the if uh, the, the the these two tasks are technically separable, so you know you you are not interfered by studying uh, game theory, uh, then uh, you just consider the cons consider the optimization problem of studying uh, contract theory uh, separately. Okay, so if delta is zero. Then you can you can you can you can think about these two problems separately. You can think about these two uh, tasks separately. So there is no no more multi multitasking problem. So in other words, the the at the at the heart of multitasking problem, there is delta, which is the let's say exhaustion parameter or exhaustion effect. Okay, so we have to think about this multitasking. So the the multitasking problem in reality uh, doesn't exist if the these two tasks do not interfere each other. But if they interfere each other, then we have to think about this multitasking problem. Okay, so uh, again, uh, just to check uh, whether you understand it or not, or whether the solution is right or wrong, uh, just put zero in delta and uh, see whether this expression boils down to the expression that we found in the basic principle agent model. All right. But I don't want to do that right now, so uh, I just move on. Uh, so it can be shown that uh, uh, partial uh, round round s s two star of of, of round uh, sigma two squared is uh, smaller than zero. So what does that mean? So if you differentiate this s two star with respect to uh, sigma two squared, then it is negative. No surprise at all. So this this is what what we saw before as the measure of uh, task 2 becomes noisier, the principal wants to give a weaker incentive on task 2. So the principal wants to give weaker incentive on task 2, which means the principal uh, doesn't want to rely on the uh, very noisy measure, or it, it, it also means that the principal doesn't want to give uh, too much risk to the uh, worker, because you know, if sigma two squared is very large, then that means uh, it is very noisy. So if uh, if you increase s two, then that that may then then you will have to uh, expose the worker to too much risk, and you don't want to do that. So uh, you want to reduce s two. That's what we found before. So this is not new. What is new is this: the second bullet point. Moreover, uh, if you differentiate S1 star uh, with respect to sigma 2 star, can, can you see that? So you differentiate S1 star with respect to sigma 2 star, 
it is also the, the derivative is also negative. So if task two becomes noisier, then you want to reduce the incentive on task one. Okay, the principal wants to reduce the piece rate of task one. Otherwise, the agent would put too much effort on task one while too little effort on task two. But that's not uh, what you want. So you want to uh, you you want the agent uh, put uh, balanced effort on uh, both uh, tasks. So uh, for that, you want you you will have to reduce S one star as well. Okay, so that's basically it. And at the bottom, uh, at the third bullet point, uh, is basically it says basically the same thing. If the performance on task two is unobservable, uh, which means sigma two squared goes to infinity, then S one star is uh, it looks like this c2 minus delta over c2 plus uh, eta uh, times sigma 1 squared times c1 c2 minus delta squared and that is smaller or equal to uh, it is smaller than 1 over 1 plus eta times c1 times uh, sigma 1 squared which is uh, the optimal uh, Piece rate optimal optimal uh, incentive uh, in the basic principle agent model. Okay, so that's, that's that means basically the same thing. So you you want to reduce uh, the incentive on task one as well. So uh, what's the lesson here? Uh, what do we learn? So the lesson lesson is. Uh, if the measurability of the two tasks are very different, then you, you cannot give a very strong incentive on either of the tasks. You have to give weak incentives on both tasks. And that may be inefficient. That may uh, invite additional uh, inefficiency. So when you design uh, a job, you have to think about this. So we move on to the next question, uh, which is the task location and job design. So suppose that there are n tasks and two risk averse agents. So there are many, many tasks, but there are only two agents. And epsilon i, epsilon j for any i and j are independent. And how should the task be allocated to the these two agents? And the answer is we, we don't want to uh, consider uh, the model uh, very rigorously. Uh, we, we, we just uh, talk about this very briefly. So the principle uh, wants to information homogeneity. What that means is hard to measure tasks go to one agent and easy to measure tasks to the other agent. And by doing so, uh, the principle can give strong incentives to at least one agent. If everything is mixed up, then the principal cannot give strong incentive to any agent. But if just you know put all the uh, hard hard to measure task uh, to one agent and put the all the easy to measure task to the other agent, then you can give strong incentive to one at least one agent uh, the, 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 to the agent who is doing easy to measure tasks, right? So. Uh, it is more efficient uh, to do that. So it is more efficient uh, to give uh, strong incentives uh, to at least one agent. So that's the reason why you need, uh, you want uh, information homogeneity. So that's one thing that you have to consider when you design a job. Uh, probably in reality, there are many other things to consider. So. Uh, but we don't. We 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 cannot talk about that uh, right now. So uh, that's it for today. So when the performance of task is difficult to measure, uh, it may be optimal to give very weak incentives to every task. And when design job, uh, the principal wants the information homogeneity. Okay. So that's it uh, for today. Right. Uh, bye.